Colossians chapter 1. We're going to be in verse 24 today. We're going verse 24 to 29. I had, I had it booked for Colossians 1, 24 through chapter 2, verse 5, but I think we're going to run out of time. So we'll, uh, we'll do 24 to 29, see how far we get. Colossians chapter 1, 24 to 29. I'm going to set this up just for a second, and then we'll, we'll read it together. But just to say, we do two kinds of series as a church. We do books of the Bible, and we do topical series. So sometimes we'll take a topic like marriage or finances or relationships, whatever it may be, and we'll kind of dive deep on what is all that the Bible has to say about that topic. We'll do a big biblical survey and then dive into that topic. And that's important. That's helpful. Actually, a lot of the sermons that you see in Scripture are topical sermons, like the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17. He says, Hey, you see that statue of the unknown God? Let me talk to you about something in your world, and I'm going to talk to you about what the Bible says about that thing. But then we've also got books of the Bible that we just kind of work through. We, we call those series, those sermon series or a series of sermons put together, we just call them book studies. Like we're studying the book of Colossians. And you may ask, Dylan, why do you do that? Like, why do you do topical? Why do you do books? Well, topical because there's topics that are relevant to your life that are important to understand what does God say about this? Then we do books of the Bible because, honestly, it's tempting as a preacher to cherry pick. It's, it's tempting as a preacher to just preach the things that feel good and, and look good and it's kind of easy to talk about or things that I just love. Like, I love talking about prayer and devotional life. I love talking about telling people about Jesus. I don't like talking about some of the nitty-gritty details of church unity. Like, it's, like, it's a little boring to me. But when you go through a book of the Bible, it forces me as a preacher and us as a church to say, you know what? This book really is an authority over our life, and we don't get to cherry pick. We don't get to pick and choose. We're going to sit under it. We're going to let it be an authority to us. We're going to let it guide the conversation of where we go. So it's not just the hot topic of the week, but it's really what is the Word of God saying to us? And so this is a bit of a longer series. I think when I mapped it, it's like 17 weeks through the book of Colossians. So hopefully by the end of it, we're all like scholars in the book of Colossians, all right? Like you, can, you can put that on your resume. I'm a scholar on the book of Colossians. And and if they say, what school did you go to, just don't say, because I don't want to be in trouble for what you, what you believe, all right? So, but no, Colossians 20, Colossians chapter 1, verse 24 through 29, if you'll stand with me to honor the reading of God's word. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. This is the word of the Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Good to see you up in the balcony, folks. Great to have you this morning. Okay, Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. I'm just going to kind of go verse by verse. We're going to walk through this thing together. He says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. So just to kind of take, tackle the first bit here, he says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. He says, I'm rejoicing not in spite of my sufferings, but actually in my suffering. I'm, I'm rejoicing in the fact that I'm suffering because my suffering has purpose. My suffering is not just suffering for the sake of suffering. My suffering is suffering for the sake of your success. I'm rejoicing in my suffering. What suffering are you talking about, Paul? Well, he says, I've got persecutions, hardships. I've been shipwrecked. I've been beaten. I've been stoned. And not this kind of stone, but this kind of stone. Like he's been stoned. <laughs> He's been left for dead. He's been whipped again and again and again. He has suffered in a way that many of us have never suffered. And he says, I rejoice in my sufferings. Listen, I struggle to rejoice when I wake up and I got a tummy ache. You know, like, I, I do. I got some acid reflux issues. And some days I wake up and I'm a grump. You know, I'm just like, I feel sick. He's rejoicing in his sufferings. Like, Paul gets 
stoned, left for dead, he wakes up and he's like, come on, Jesus. Like, that's just, that's, that he's rejoiced. How is he doing that? Well, he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. His suffering has purpose. He's suffering for the sake of God's people or God's church, for the sake of building up the body of Christ. And you know what? I don't know what your suffering is. Maybe it's financial suffering. Maybe it's relational suffering. Maybe it's physical suffering. Maybe you've got a chronic health issue that is just plaguing you day after day after day. I don't know what your suffering is. Maybe it's workplace suffering, like, I'm going to kill my boss. I don't know what your (laughs) suffering is. But I'm telling you, if you don't have purpose in your suffering, if you can't see God's hand in it, and maybe you can't see God's hand in it, but if you don't have this confident assurance that behind the scenes that God is working all things for good, for those who love him and are called according to his purposes, that's Romans 8, 28. If you don't live with that, then you are going to feel stuck in your suffering and not succeeding in your suffering or, or suffering for the success of another because you don't have this confidence that there's purpose in your suffering. He's got purpose in his suffering. He's also got perspective in his suffering. Second, Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, he says, for this light momentary affliction. S- say what, Paul? Beaten, shipwrecked, stoned, left for dead? Light, momentary affliction. This is like nothing to me. This light, momentary affliction. I want you to just consider the weighty, challenging, difficult things in your life. And I want you to just put that label on them. Maybe it's the chronic health issues. Maybe it's the marriage that is really struggling right now. Maybe it's the kids that have gone astray. Maybe it is something financially or in your workplace. Whatever your suffering is in this life, could you just put this label on it this morning? Just imagine it in your mind's eye and and put this label on it of this light, momentary affliction because that's what it is in light of eternity is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison paul's not talking about stubbing his toe he's talking about incredible suffering and he says it's a light it's a light sorry i don't know what happened there it's a light (laughs) momentary affliction compared to the eternal weight of glory. When I was younger, $10,000 looked like a lot of money. Still is a lot of money. Imagine I spent a day with Jeff Bezos. All of a sudden, $10,000 would not seem like a lot of money. $10,000 would seem like a drop in a bucket. What's the difference in my experience? It's simply this. It's perspective. When you feel like your suffering is this big and your God is this big, you probably need some time in worship. You you probably need some time to just open this book and remind yourself of who he is. You probably need some time just to stand with the body. That's why I love Sunday mornings. It's why I love coming and being led in worship like we were this morning to get my eyes off of myself and off of my problems and onto the one who's greater than it all. Because in light of who he is and in light of where he's leading us, it is a light, momentary affliction. Not only does Paul have perspective in his suffering, he says there's purpose in my suffering. He says, I'm I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. Now, that is mind-boggling to me because he says there's something lacking in the affliction of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who gave his life in love for us. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who went and died a sinner's death on a cross for us. Jesus Christ, who had nails pierced into his hands and his feet for us. Jesus Christ, who had a crown of thorns pressed down upon his head. He was beaten and whipped, and he was mocked and spit upon and shamed for us. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who at the end of his last breaths on the cross, he said, it is finished. Like, I have paid for your sins in full. He says, Paul says, there is something lacking. In the affliction of Jesus Christ? I'm like, no, Paul. You got that wrong, bro. There is nothing lacking in the affliction of Jesus Christ. And there's not for our salvation, for our forgiveness, for our ability to have a relationship with him. There's nothing lacking. So, Paul, what are you talking about, man? He's filling up in his body what is lacking in the affliction of Jesus Christ. Well, what is it? It's a personal experience. Or a personal expression of the love of God through a human person right here, right now. I'll tell you a story. A few months ago, my son 
Hudson Gabriel Michael Neely, as he likes to tell you. He, you say, what's your name? He's not okay with Hudson. It's got to be all of it. You know, like, he's, boy loves his name. A few months ago, he's sleeping. Rebecca and I are downstairs. I think we're playing board games or something. And uh, I hear this noise, like this, and it's a weird dad moment, you know, because mom normally hears it, but I heard it this time. <laughs> and, uh, and I could barely hear him, and it sounded like he was trying to catch his breath. Like, <gasps> And I sprinted up the stairs, and I come in his bedroom, and he's literally like, <gasps> and he couldn't catch his breath. And I called Rebecca. I was like, Rebecca, I don't, I don't know what's about. Like, I thought he was going to stop breathing. Rush him into the bathroom, turn on the hot water. I thought maybe it's croup cough or inflammation or something. Couldn't figure it out. And we're sitting there watching our son barely, like barely able to breathe. It's one of the most terrifying, maybe the most terrifying moments as a parent thus far. And we rush him to the hospital. I've got my mirror pointed on him because I'm thinking if he stops breathing the whole time I'm like son you breathing say say dad say dad say dad because I'm just like if he stops breathing I gotta pull this car over do whatever I can to get him to breathe and we get him to the hospital barely get him checked into the triage nurse and Dan Evans sends me a text he says I'm in the waiting room if you need me I'm here and in that moment I felt God's presence through Dan's presence I felt God's love through Dan's love what was lacking in the affliction of Christ for me in that moment was not the finished work of Jesus on the cross. It was a personal expression of his love for me. And I experienced it in a way I hadn't experienced it before. Because in my moment of need, someone stepped in when they didn't have to. They, he suffered, probably a lack of sleep, <laughs> probably some inconvenience, to show me the love of God in Christ. Paul is saying, I'm suffering for the sake of the body of Jesus Christ. People do this all the time. Our King's Kids leaders every week are filling up what's lacking in Christ's afflictions for the kids in our class. Is there anything lacking in God's love for kids? No. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. As a matter of fact, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven if you don't enter like one of them. Humble, needy, dependent. They are an instruction manual for us in terms of how we are to relate to God. Very needy. <laughs> That's the only way you can get in, y'all. You can't get in like this. You got to come in like this, please. You know, like that's, that's the only way. That's the only way. And he loves them. He delights in them. But they won't know that if somebody doesn't stand in the gap for them. Our greeters do it every week. Our production does it every week. There are people in this church filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions by leading small groups or opening their home. Or Kathy Jadlow, I don't know if she's in here. That woman does not step foot in this building without saying, yes, keep it up. She's never stood on a stage. She doesn't step foot in this building without saying, hey, what can I do? What needs done? How can I serve? Every single time. I want to say this, that, that Jesus gave his life for the church, which means that following Jesus means that we would give our life for the building of his church. I want to say it this way, that every single Christian should make it their life mission. This is my life mission. I want to partner with Jesus in building his church. That should be your life mission. If you've wondered what your life mission is, if you've made the dream board, you've written the mission statement, and this is what my life's all about, scratch it all out. <laughs> this is what your life mission should be if you're a Christian. I want to partner with Jesus in building his church. That may make, take a million different forms. It may be serving here. It may be Bible studies in your workplace. It may be discipling and training your kids in the way of Jesus. It may be loving your spouse and and, and honoring them and serving them and caring. Maybe look at a million different ways for a million different people. Actually, my life mission is to partner with Jesus in building his church. And that looks like loving Rebecca like Christ loves the church. That looks like nurturing and training my children in the way of the Lord. It looks like leading this church faithfully with all my heart. It looks like honoring God by faithfully managing our finances. It, it looks like loving my neighbors and blessing them with the message of Jesus. <laughs> There are other people in this church you may feel called to serve the homeless in our community. There are others you may feel called to start Bible studies in your workplace. That, 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 and actually, there's some people doing that right now in the church that are making a massive impact. Shout out to Coach Thomas over there who became a member this morning who is speaking life into and bringing the word of God into his workplace by discipling the next generation and teaching them what it means to take the gospel into their school. Praise God for what that man and that family and maybe maybe God this morning is like putting something on your heart like maybe he's laying a burden like that in front of you and you feel like Dylan I don't know what to do with that 
I don't know where to take that. I don't know what my next step is. Let me encourage you, don't ignore it. Lean into it. Like if God is burdening your heart with something that he has for you to do, lean into that. Because he wants to use you to build his church. Make it your life ambition and life mission to build the church Jesus gave his life for. Verse 25, Paul says, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship. Turn to your neighbor and say stewardship. Stewardship. Stewardship from God that was given to me for you. Notice this, he says, there's a stewardship from God given to me for you. A stewardship from God given to me for you. Turn to your neighbor and say, from God for you. From God for you. Did you pick your other neighbor? Because if not, you're just showing preference. It's not cool, all right? You don't do that in church, all right? You gotta, you gotta switch, you gotta switch, all right? Just turn to your other neighbor and say, hey, I'd like you to. You know, I like you. God loves you. God loves you, I don't. You know, like that's, uh, there's a stewardship from God given to me for you. This word stewardship means to manage something that isn't your own. Think of a financial advisor. I have a financial advisor because I want to retire one day. And I give him money, not a lot, but I give him money. And I say, manage this on my behalf. Right? Can't, so it's not his money. He'll go to jail if he treats it like his money. But he manages it on my behalf in a way that's pleasing to me. That's actually what we do with our money, is that it's actually God's money. It's not my money. I manage it in a way that's pleasing to him, or at least I hope I do so. And that's what he's called all of us to do. We do it with our kids. If you have kids, when someone watches your children, the kids don't become their children. And the people that watch kids are like, praise the Lord, because they're crazy. You know? like, <laughs> oh, man, it's true. Okay, so they don't become their kids. They're stewarding those children for you. And as a parent, that's your greatest treasure, right? Like, you better treat my kids like a treasure, because if something happens to them, we ain't our friends no more. You know, like, this is I'm kidding. Everybody who watches them, thank you. God bless you. But, uh, <laughs> but they're stewarding something that's been entrusted to them. Paul says this calling, this gifting, this grace on my life has been given to me from God. It's a stewardship that I'm managing, that I'm being faithful with for you. It's, it's given to me for you. Let me tell you, the gift of God on your life is not for you. That leadership gift on your life is not mainly so you can do well in business and make a lot of money for your family. That leadership, it's, it is for that, but that leadership gift on your life is mainly given by God so that you can serve his people by building his church. That, that administration gift on your life is not just to be like an amazing executive assistant. That, that administration gift on your life is given to you by God for the church so that you can build his body. You fill in the blank with whatever gift God has given you. There's a, there's a lot of people that I could call out this morning and say, man, I see them using their gift and them using their gift and them using their gift. We have over 115 people on the dream team, week in and week out, using their gift for building the body of Christ. People praying, people serving, people loving. There's so many ways that we do it. Maybe you're asking yourself, Dylan, how do I discover what my gift is so that I can use it to build the church. Well, there's two ways I would just say you can discover your purpose. There's more, but these two are very basic. Number one, by serving Jesus. You'll never discover what your gift or your calling is by sitting on your hands. Think of it like a baby in the crib, right? Like when they're, when they're young, they just, everyone, like they'll start to move their hand and they'll kind of look at it like, where'd that thing come from? You know, like they don't even know it's theirs. They're just like figuring out how these things work. You know, it's like, ah, you know. You know, and that's all that stuff happens. It's babies, you know, and then they chew on it and it's gross and slobber. And that's kind of how we are in our walk. And you begin to learn how you're gifted, how you're graced, how you can best serve the body simply by doing it. Another way is by living in community. So I love to sing. I don't listen to a lot of music, but I love to sing. And I will sing with great passion and great joy but not great tone yeah. <laughs> or tune, whatever y'all are saying. You know, like it, I've had people, I had an elder in our last church. I was sitting on the second row. He was on the first row. After worship, he turned around and said, what were you doing? <laughs> uh, I had a friend of mine, we were in Chicago. We were on a little like one month thing, helping plan a church. And, and we'd circle up every morning and eight of us guys would sing our hearts out to Jesus and pray. And, 
And one morning he pulled me aside after worship. He said, hey, you know I love you, right? Yeah, I know you love me. He said, I love it when you sing me, Jesus. Yeah, me too. And uh, he's like, it's just super distracting to me. <laughs> so if you could do it quieter. <laughs> can I say this? <laughs> I hope I can say this. So I'm, I'm, drive, I'm driving to the building the other day. And I'm thinking about Rebecca. And I, my heart started to feel real warm towards, towards her. And so I started to sing a love song. And I thought, oh, girl, come on, you know? Like, and so I hit the voice memo button, you know? And I sang her my love song. And I hit sin, and I regretted it when I did it. And, uh, and I just get a laughing face back. Just a laughing face. And I thought, I thought, there's tears, but she must be crying, you know? Like, it's, it's like, the girl's crying, you know? And I get home, I get home, and I'm like, what do you think about the song? And she says, stay in your lane, bro. <laughs> Not even making this up. Not even making this up. So I write letters. I write letters, y'all. That's my romance. I write letters. Okay. That's how you discover your gifts, all right? Verse 25. To make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. I don't know if I can move on. Uh, this word... This gospel of Jesus is a mystery that was hidden for ages. First Peter chapter 1, verse 10 to 12 says, The prophets and angels long to see it. It's been revealed to us, his saints. And if you ever thought like saints were those really special Christians, like, man, those Christians did some really cool stuff. They were the real good Christians. No, no, actually, if you read through the epistles or the letters in the New Testament, Paul, or the author of the epistles, starts almost every single epistle with an introduction saying to the saints. And in some places, he even says to the saints or brothers. And what he's saying is every person who calls on the name of Jesus is a saint. You've been washed. You've been cleansed. There's, there's no hierarchy of Christians. We are all on the same playing field of we have been redeemed by Jesus Christ. And that is our only hope for a relationship with him. Paul says that this salvation, this mystery has been revealed to us. And it's his ambition to make this word of God Fully known. What is fully known? Well, I believe it means to be known broadly, that every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation would hear the message of Jesus Christ. That is Paul's mission. That is Jesus' mission. That's to be our mission. That we give our lives with our finances, with our time, with our energy, with our speech to help people who are far from Jesus come into a relationship with him. And I know many Christians feel afraid of sharing their faith. You feel timid, you feel insecure, you feel unsure of what to say, you feel like, I don't know enough, or I'm going to mess it up. And listen, you're not, you're not going to mess up what Jesus has done for them on the cross, you don't have to worry about that. But I do want to give you a little acronym that we use as a church called BLESS, and this is what we do. We say, hey, this is one of the missional, some of the missional rhythms we see in the life and ministry of Jesus that we try and practice in our lives. So maybe you've got a neighbor named Joe. What are you going to do? You're going to start praying for Joe every day. God, bless Joe. Speak to Joe. Reveal yourself to Joe. What are you going to do? You're going to say, hey, Joe, how was your day? And you just got to listen. Christians, we got to do less of this and more of this. God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. He's good at math. So we need to listen and then eat. You're going to say, hey, Joe, and his wife, and his kids, or maybe roommate, like, come over and have dinner with my family. I just want to love on you, get to know you, hear your story, have you in my home. And, and then we're going to serve Joe. We're going to say, Joe, what do you need? What's going on in your life? I promise you, you do the first three, they'll just tell you what the fourth one is. They'll tell you how to do it. They do every time. Because every single one of us has a need in our life that God wants to meet. And the fourth one is to share our story and the story of Jesus. If you don't know what to say, do what the woman in John chapter 4 did. Simply tell them that you've met the Son of God that he's changed your life. Tell them your personal story, and in doing so, you're going to tell them the story of Jesus Christ. We're all called to make the word of God known to the people that God has put in our life. Maybe it's neighbors. Maybe it's coworkers. Maybe it's family members. My guess is it's all of them. Also, we want to know the word of God more deeply for ourselves. What does that look like? Well, it looks like having a time in your day where you open this and you read the word, you meditate on the word, you study the word, you let the word study you and change your life. It looks like being in a small group of people. We do small groups. We've got eight groups in this church. You can join any of them. But it looks like getting in a small group of people or a community and saying, hey, what do you see? I love this. I'll preach this 
And then on Tuesday, I'll open this with my small group, and I'll say, what do you guys see? And they'll tell me stuff that I'll say, dang it, I wish I would have known that last week so I could preach it, you know, because that's better than what I said. But because you see more when you see it with other people. God reveals his word to his people, not just to a person. We want to know the God. We want to make the word of God more fully known. We also want to know it more fully in our life. Another thing I would say about knowing the word of God in your life, there's a difference between head knowledge and heart. I can get head knowledge on my own. I can get heart knowledge in the presence of God. I can get foot knowledge or like applying this and walking it out and living it in community. Many of us, we have too much pride. I confess it in my own life. Even over the last month, there's been areas in my life where people who love me enough said things to me and I said, oh, wow, I didn't see that. You're right. And I've been asking God, God, show me your love in a way I've not understood. Every one of us has blind spots in our life. You know when you're driving, you got a blind spot? You, anybody have that double mirror? Like you got a mirror within your mirror in your car? That thing is the bomb, all right? Like I've got that in my car. And, and the other day I'm driving, and the first mirror, couldn't see anything. Look over my shoulder, can't see anything. Someone is in the perfect blind spot. But the little mirror, it picked them up. Each and every one of us, we have blind spots in our life. And the only way you see your blind spots is you have somebody tell you. And let me tell you, if you don't know, if you don't have people in your life telling you, hey, I'm concerned about this area. Hey, I see this thing that maybe you don't see. It's not because it's not there. <laughs> it's because you don't have people close enough to tell you. And I'll tell you, there's a difference between fun friends and faithful friends. <laughs> faithful are the wounds of a brother. I love those. I like my fun friends. I love my faithful friends. Your faithful friends will tell you the things you don't like to hear because they love you more than they love the approval that you give them. Mm -hmm. Your fun friends just want to hang out and have a party. You know, it's like both are good, but you, you need a couple people in your life that will be honest with you and love you enough to tell you. Verse 27, to, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is glory? Glory is God's power his weight or his radiance. It's an indescribable weight or gravitas. You know those people who walk in a room and you're just like, man, there's some gravity going. Like those people got some gravity in the room. God walks in the room and he has all the gravity. Like everything goes, he has incredible gravity or weight. He has incredible power. He has incredible radiance. And all of God's glory is at work in your life and mine. This is the hope of glory, which is Christ. In you, there's, there's this incredible reality in the Christian life that the Spirit of Jesus Christ lives in you and I, not because we're awesome, but because we believe in Him. That the Spirit of Jesus lives in us. And what that does to us is something remarkable. What it does to you, if you really grab hold of that truth, that the Spirit of Jesus Christ lives in me, that, that He is the salt of the earth in me, that He is the light of the world in me, that, that He is the pillar of truth in me, that, that He is the hope of glory in me, when you walk in a room, that does something to your insecurities. It does something to that preoccupation with what everybody thinks about me. It does something to you being inward and it allows you to be outward. You can actually walk in a room with the confidence that every room I walk in, you can do this tomorrow at work. When I walk in my workplace, I am a blessing from the moment my foot hits that front door. Dylan, that seems arrogant. It's not arrogant, it's confident. Because Jesus in you is a light through you. This is also why sin is so grievous, because the Holy Spirit of God himself lives in us. So when we do things with our bodies that he doesn't like, we're literally doing it a, a sin against ourselves and against the spirit of Jesus himself. This is the hope of glory in us. Verse 28, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. He says, we proclaim Jesus. That's a core value at King's Church, that Jesus is our message. And what we like to say is that we preach good news before we preach good advice. Both are important. Like the, the book of Proverbs has a place. The book of James has a place. There's some wisdom books that will teach you how to do life, teach you how to manage finances, teach you how to do relationships, teach you how to control your anger, teach you how to have sexual purity. Those things are important. But before we have good advice, we need good news. 
We need to hear that God loves us, that he chose us, that Jesus died for us, that there's a resurrected life for us, that there's a hope of glory for us. And, and that good news has priority in first place, which then makes space for good advice. It makes the good advice fit in its proper place. We preach Christ and Christ crucified. That's our message. And then God's wisdom is the fullness thereof. But he, Paul says this. He says that maturity is my aim, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Maturity is the target to strive for. And I would just ask you, what does Christian maturity look like in your life? If you were to give yourself advice and say, hey, Dylan, this area of your life, it could really use some more maturity. What would you say is the area of your life? Or maybe what would your closest Christian friend say is the area of your life that needs more maturity? And if you don't know the answer to that question, the bold, scary thing to do is to go ask them. Maybe go ask your small group leader, hey, is there an area of my life that needs more maturity? Because if you don't know what it is, this is God's goal for your life, that you would be mature in Christ. He says he's warning and teaching. It's a negative and a positive. And a warning is saying, hey, hey, don't do this because this will happen if you do. I do this with my kids. See, the other day, my kids are riding their bikes around a cul-de-sac, and, and summer is just, woo, 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 you know, just circling that thing up. And, and when we see cars come in, we say, car, and they stop, and, and she's doing circles, and I said, stop, car, and she keeps going. And I said, stop, and she keeps going. I said, stop, and she's about to get plowed over by this car. I mean, it was probably like 10 feet away, but it was a scary moment, and, uh, and she comes over crying. goes fast, you get hit, die. You know, like this. And uh, she's crying, she's upset, but I needed her to feel the weight of the moment. It's a real warning. Why? Because there's a real danger. Let me tell you, the white lies at work are not innocent. They corrupt your character, they destroy your witness. The impurity when no one's looking is not innocent. It's corrupting your soul. It's separating you in your relationship with God. It's destroying the relationships around you. There's warnings that God gives us because he loves us. There's also teaching that he gives us. He doesn't just call us out of sin. He calls us into kingdom living. And parents, just some free parenting advice. We do this with our kids as well. We should never correct our kids on something we never taught them. Teaching comes first. We teach them the right way, and then we correct them to bring them back to it when they go astray. And we've learned this the hard way. We've corrected our kids and gone, oh, we never taught got to teach him the right thing first. God does the same thing with us. He's never calling you out of something when he's not calling you into something. He's always calling you into something greater. Verse 29, I'm going to wrap it up here. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me, bringing the church to full maturity with the passion of Paul's life. His role in that was teaching and preaching. He said he toiled at it. He labored. He worked. He expended himself. Imagine the farmer working all day, morning to evening. The farmer is working the field, so Paul is working the message of the gospel for the good of the church. But he says he did it, not with his energy, not with his strength, but with God's energy that he powerfully worked in me. Paul says, I'm working, but it's God's energy working through me. Friends, when you serve the church, when you build the church, when you give your life to building the church in partnership with Jesus Christ through your family, through this community, through your witness, when you do that, you got to remember that it's not your strength. It's not your energy. It's not your ability to pull it off, but it's, it's God's strength working through me. We did this as a dream team this morning. We were praying and worshiping, and, and we just said, you know what? We need to wait upon the Lord. Like he said, if you wait upon me, you'll renew your strength. If you wait upon the Lord, there's this renewal that's come, this strength that comes that it does not come any other way. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 11, that his burden is light, his yoke is easy, and all who come to him will find rest for their souls. There's this working and this waiting. There's, there's this refreshing, empowering energy that comes from God himself that allows us to do incredible Activity. The grace of God in your life will not produce inactivity. It will produce great activity, but it will be empowered by him and him alone. Band, if you could come up, I'm going to wrap it up here. So, so what does it look like to toil, to strive, to work, to build God's church? Well, a couple things. Number one, if you 
If you've not joined the Dream Team, then go through Growth Track and join the Dream Team. If you're not in a small group, that'd be a great next step. Maybe it's giving generously or attending first Wednesday, this Wednesday, 7 o'clock. We're going to be praying our guts out for the work God is doing in this church. Maybe it's inviting someone to Easter or sharing your faith with someone who's far from God. Here's some next steps that maybe you're walking away with today. Ask God to grow your love for his church. It could be a simple prayer during this time of worship. Just God, honestly, I love my life more than I love your church. I love my priorities and my preferences and my comforts more than I love your people. Would you grow my love for your church? That'd be a great prayer to pray. Maybe giving yourself to encouragement and unity like the Apostle Paul did. Maybe committing to use your gifts to build the body of Christ. Or maybe your next step is telling others, I'm taking that card and I'm inviting somebody this week. If you'll stand with me, I want to pray for us before we end it in worship. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to take a step today where you say, Jesus, I see that you're the son of God, that you died on a cross for my sins, that you rose from the dead to give me life in your name. Maybe you're coming here this morning because you're like, you know what, Dylan, I need to start a relationship with God. And I, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. I just know I need to be here. And I would say, that's amazing. We're so glad you're here. The first step for you is to come to the son of God, Jesus Christ. And say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Please give me a new life with you. I surrender all that I am to you. I come to you as my God and my Savior, and I say, please forgive me, clean me, cleanse me, make me new so that I can follow you all the days of my life. And if that's you and you know I'm ready to pray that prayer today, Dylan. Or maybe you're coming here saying, Dylan, you know, I've done that. I've walked with God, but man, have I been far from him. I have not been walking with him. And I feel a little bit like that prodigal son who knew the father's love and knew the father's house and knew what it was like to be in the father's presence. And man, I've gone, I've kind of done my own thing for a while. But I know today is the day that I need to come back. Today is the day I need to begin a relationship with him again. I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus this morning or to come back to him. So, friends, if we could all close our eyes, bow our heads. At King's Church, we all prayed together because we wanted to be a safe place pray this prayer, take this step towards God. So church, would you join with me as I pray? Say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for sending Jesus. I believe that he is your son. I believe that he is your son. I believe that he died for my sins. I believe that he died for my sins. I believe that he rose from the dead. I believe that he rose from the dead. I confess that I have sinned. Please forgive. Church, let me pray for us, and then the band will lead us in a final song. Just hold out your hands to heaven. Say, Father, here I am. Grow my love for your church. Help me to see your love for me. May it change me. May it transform me. Fill me with your spirit. Today as, I worship. We worship you, Jesus. We praise you. We bless you. We honor you. We come to you as the one from all, who all of our energy, all of our strength, all of our grace comes from. So I say, come, Holy Spirit, and fill this place as we worship the Son of God. All God's people said.